thank you very much, and uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present some of our work uh, today. Um, uh, adaptive Biotechnologies is uh, pioneering uh, the use of immunosequencing uh, to facilitate immunologic discovery. Now, uh, for those of you who were attending track one yesterday, you heard my uh, new colleague, uh, Tom Willis, the former CEO of Sequenta, uh, talk uh, about some, an exciting announcement that occurred earlier this month, where through uh, acquisition and merger, uh, Adaptive Biotechnologies and Sequenta uh, are now a single company, uh, which is combining the complementary uh, expertise and experience into a, a more empowered uh, opportunity to develop and pioneer uh, immunosequencing. Now, when I speak of immunosequencing, what I'm referring to is the enumeration, specification, and quantification of each and every B and or T cell in any biologic sample of interest through the direct nucleotide sequencing of the hypervariable region of the T cell receptors and the immunoglobulin genes. Now, Clearly, by doing that, uh, the applications are myriad and can be uh, focused on any situation in which one wishes to interrogate the lymphocyte population uh, within a particular disease or tissue or other source. Um, the most immediate applications, however, uh, have come from work in hematology and oncology, specifically to date looking at immune reconstitution post bone marrow transplant in the study of immunotherapy, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, of which I'll be doing some uh, discussion today, and in monitoring uh, the situation where one or another of those lymphocytes is malignantly transformed into a leukemia, lymphoma, or myeloma, uh, in which case it allows for the diagnosis, but also the monitoring of those patients with regard to response to uh, therapy, therapeutic intervention for residual disease, um, which Tom spoke about yesterday. And again, um, Tom went into some detail about the underlying platform. Just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'm going to briefly uh, discuss it as well. Um, each and every B or T cell uh, carries within it, unlike every other cell in the body, a unique barcode, uh, which is formed from uh, the creation of the hypervariable or antigen uh, binding specific site within the T cell receptors and immunoglobulins. And the way that this is created um, is as follows. The genes that will eventually comprise our functional immunoglobulins or T cell receptors exist within our germline DNA as a number of discrete and non-contiguous segments. There are multiple variable or V segments separated by stretches of genomic DNA from diversity or D segments which are similarly uh, separated by genomic DNA from joining or J segments. And as a prerequisite to the formation of a functional immunoglobulin or T cell receptor, any one of those V segments can undergo a site-specific recombination event with any one of those D segments, which has uh, previously undergone a site-specific recombination event with one of those J segments, to form a now contiguous VDJ region. And furthermore, through that breakage and rejoining event at the level of the DNA, at the time of the ligation, non-templated or N nucleotides are added such that the region encircled there, which is the primary antigen binding site of these molecules, it becomes enormously diverse at the primary nucleotide level. 
It is through the development of forward primers that recognize each and every V segment for a given locus and reverse primers that recognize each and every J segment uh, for a given locus that then amplify across that hypervariable nucleotide sequence and therefore read out the unique rearrangement that has occurred within that lymphocyte and that is carried, therefore, by all of its clonal progeny. So um, uh, having uh, said that, uh, obviously, again, you can use this to identify, quantify, and track a lymphocyte in any tissue of interest. And with regard to immunotherapy, obviously, this becomes critical because knowing the immune response, either systemically or within the tumor itself, um, can be of uh, great value in consideration of what is going on. And the fundamental question then that uh, we are beginning to explore using this technology is how do the various different forms of immunotherapy work, whether it be the kinds of therapies that uh, Dr. Melman just described, the vaccines or the CART therapies, or these monoclonal antibodies that recognize uh, CTLA-4 or PD-1 or PDL one And beyond how they work, can, it, can they be used to either predict what patients might respond or to inform as to which patients have responded? So uh, I want to give some examples of this, and the first two examples are based on studies in which we participated with uh, Tony Rebus' uh, group at UCLA. And the first one was looking at that first generation of immunotherapy, the anti-CTLA-4, where we looked systemically and said, what is the effect of CTLA-4 on the circulating T cell repertoire in these patients? And what we discovered, as shown on this slide, is that in response to CTLA-4, both the absolute number of uniquely rearranged T cell receptor uh, genes goes up, and the diversity uh, index, by which I mean th the, uh, not just the total number, but also the distribution of those T cells uh, also increases. It is as if um, the uh, cells that had been either sequestered or kept at bay um, are suddenly released into the circulation by the administration of an anti-CTLA-4 antibody. Now, if you think about this and ask, well, what were they doing previously or why were they being sequestered or kept at bay? One of the possibilities is because uh, it was, uh, they were uh, counterproductive to normal uh, human physiology because perhaps they recognized determinants that were self as opposed to foreign. And indeed, when you look at that, you find that this increase corresponds also to the toxicity that has been observed with the administration of an anti-CTLA-4 monoclonal antibody, namely this release from uh, the limitation of diversification and production of a T cell repertoire is associated with an increase in the toxicity and adverse events accompanying CTLA-4 administration, many of which are uh, reminiscent of fundamental autoimmune disorders. In the next generation that Dr. Melman also mentioned, uh, the anti-PD-1 or anti-PDL-1 uh, monoclonal antibodies, there is uh, less of an effect on the systemic circulation, but more of an effect within the tumor itself. So I'm going to describe a study uh, that came out recently, again from the Rebus Group in Nature, of uh, this past November. But before I do, uh, since we're going to be now looking at the primary tumor itself, one of the obvious questions is, well, if you take a biopsy of a tumor and you do T cell repertoire analysis, how representative would just that single biopsy be of the repertoire or of the immune response within that tumor as a whole? So we have been looking at this, and one example is shown here where uh, 
uh, with, in, with, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Odunsi, uh, we basically took uh, metastatic ovarian carcinoma samples and overlaid a grid that allowed us to uh, sample a variety of different areas within the ovarian tumor itself, shown here in these various different squares. Um, You've all heard about the concept of tumor heterogeneity, and obviously this was a, a parallel study to ask, well, what is the immune receptor heterogeneity within these metastatic lesions? So we had these different biopsy sites, and we compared each one of them to the central site there, uh, which is designated as number 13. And what we found basically was that within the tumor itself, the T cell repertoire from any one of those regions was essentially a pretty close variation on the theme of what was going on in the entire tumor. As a matter of fact, if we sampled the same site twice, we found that the similarity of that site was no more or less than the similarity of any of the surrounding sites. So therefore, basically, the variation we were seeing was to the largest extent simply a function of sampling error as opposed to fundamental repertoire difference. Now, this was quite distinct from the repertoire when we looked at adjacent normal tissue or when we looked at the circulating uh, T cell population. So having established this, we were then able to, uh, to look more closely at the tumor site itself, again in this case with the rebus group, looking at melanoma samples treated with an anti-PD-1 monoclonal antibody. And here we looked at two parameters. One parameter was the percent T cell infiltrate, namely just the number of T cells that had infiltrated uh, that particular tumor. And the other one shown on the x-axis is the clonality. Now let me just take a moment to, when I say clonality, what do I mean? If we had a patient with CLL who had a white count of 10,000 and every single one of those cells was the same, was derived from the same initial rearrangement of that primordial or that original progenitor uh, uh, B or T cell, the clonality in that patient or in that sample would be one. If in contrast, we had a, a Y count of 10,000 or 10,000 T or B cells, and each and every one of them was a, a carried a unique rearrangement, well, the clonality of that sample would approach zero. So here, what we found was that there was a correlation between the more T cells were present in <coughs> these melanoma uh, biopsies and the more clonal they were and response to therapy. The uh, uh, intersection of those two lines is where the median level of clonality and the median level of T cell infiltrate uh, intersect. And what you can see is that in the left lower quadrant, uh, you find the lowest amount of clonality and the least uh, amount of T cell infiltrate which correlates with the uh, porous prognosis or the progressors uh, in, that, uh, in this study. Uh, furthermore, if you then look subsequent to the, uh, that was prior to the uh, delivery of the anti-PD-1, if you look following the delivery of PD-1, you find that again, those uh, cells in the responders have been reactivated and you have actually amplified um, those cells that were present in the tumor and reactivated them. Again, it is as if the cells or the patients who will respond the best are those who were, whose tumors were immunogenetic, immunogenic, whose cells migrated into the tumor in order to fight it, but as Dr. Melman described, were somehow put to sleep, and then the anti-PD-1 therapy reawakens them. Well, what can be done for those uh, patients in the lower left-hand quadrant who, for whatever reason, the cells were not immunogen uh, immunogenic and who never actually mounted a T cell, uh, uh, a, a more clonal T cell infiltration in order to combat the cancer? 
well, there are, there's some evidence that you can increase the immunogenicity of, the, of a tumor. And in work done by Jennifer Wargo, uh, she was able to demonstrate, uh, from MD Anderson, she was able to demonstrate that, the, uh, that giving a BRAF inhibitor caused a unmasking of the immunogenicity of the melanoma, of the melanoma and because of that, an increase in the clonality and the T cell infiltration. Well, these are the kinds of studies that have obviously generated a great deal of interest, not just at Adaptive itself, but also with our academic and pharma partners. And we are committed uh, to continue the exploration uh, of the use of immunosequencing and uh, T cell receptor profiling uh, in order to uh, try and uh, harness and better understand the rudiments and the necessities of response to this form of therapy. Thank you very much.